Because we're going to be talking about resurrection. And so, last week we talked about how the Jews have asked Jesus of a sign. Give us a sign that shows you have the authority to do these things. And so we talked about signs and wonders and miracles last week. And this morning what we're going to talk about is the sign that Jesus offered them. And it went whoop, right over their heads. So we're going to look at John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. But then we're really going to camp in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So find 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And that's where we're, we're going to take that chapter almost verse by verse and, and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because Jesus talks about the resurrection as the sign that he is offering the Jews. Resurrection power. So let's look at John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22 first. And then we'll get to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. John chapter 2, verses 18 through 22 says this. And the Jews then said to him, that's Jesus, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? We covered that last week. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? I can't help but read that uh, you know, skeptically, right? And he was speaking of the temple of his body. And so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. When Jesus said this to the Jews, the Jews didn't get it. And to be fair, neither did the apostles, right? The apostles don't get it until, until later. So let's wrap up this idea, this sermon idea about resurrection power, into one sentence. Sermon in a sentence. The sermon in the sentence says this. Jesus' resurrection is a historical fact. And we look forward to our resurrection. John chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. His resurrection is an absolute historical fact. And it encourages us to look forward to ours. So let's start with this John chapter 2 verses 19 through 21 where you have this exchange. Because Jesus is talking in a way where his answer goes right over their heads. Why did Jesus' answer confuse them? Because they were hung up on their own building. If you knock down this building, it took 46 years to build this building up. It'll take us five decades to rebuild this, and you're talking three days. Are you insane? And of course, they were just misunderstanding. And when... Jesus' audience misunderstands what Jesus is saying. John chapter 8, verse 47, echoes through my head. I don't want to be like these people. John chapter 8, verse 47 says, He who is of God hears the words of God. And for this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. In other words, Jesus' audience that were actually listening for God to speak, heard. And for those who were not listening for God to speak, missed it. And that applies to the Jews questioning Jesus. It even applies to Jesus' apostles. And it applies to us, doesn't it? Where we miss we miss what Jesus is saying. And thankfully, he comes back to it a lot, right? How many times have we had to learn the same lesson from God over and over and over again and praise the Lord that he was patient? When Jesus is talking to the Jews, he's not talking about the physical body of the temple. He is talking about his physical form. He's talking about his body being destroyed. And in three days, his body being raised again. This is about the temple Destruction is Jesus on the cross. And the temple reconstruction is about Jesus' resurrection. There's a lot in Jesus' statement. Jesus' answer is more profound than what they were looking for. They were just looking for a, what are you talking about? And Jesus was laying down huge spiritual 
truths. When Jesus said the temple would be destroyed and then ascend three days later, he was, of course, talking about his death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. This whole chapter is entitled, The Resurrection of Christ and the Resurrection of the Dead. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. The text says this. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. When Jesus talked about the temple being destroyed, he is talking about his death. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 and 2, Paul is saying, you are saved because Jesus has died. Because Jesus died on the cross, we have the ability to have an intimate and passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. The gospel message is that the innocent died on the cross so that the guilty can have an intimate and passionate relationship with a holy God. You and I cannot approach a holy God because of our sin, our evil, and our wickedness. Sin, evil, and wickedness of action and lifestyle. Sin, evil, and wickedness of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. Sin, evil, and wickedness of thought. We were born into the situation of guilt. And we need a Savior from the outside to come in and heal us and rescue us and cleanse us. And the temple being nailed onto the cross and dying. Jesus, his death and his blood, make that forgiveness possible so that you and I, we're no longer sinners. You and I are forgiven sinners. And because we are forgiven sinners, God calls us his children so that we are sons and daughters of God. Co-heirs with Christ. He has grafted us into the vine. He changes everything about us. Because Jesus died for our sins. The innocent dying for the guilty. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what makes you and I Christians. (laughs) That's what makes you and I believers. And so when Paul is talking about the resurrection, he starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He starts with Jesus dying for our sins. The temple's destroyed. And then three days later, it is raised, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the very next section of verses 4 through 8. Verses 4 through 8 says this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 4 through 8. And that he was buried, buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and that after that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. I love that expression. That means dead. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, As to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Meaning he appeared to Paul. This is about the resurrection. Verse 4 says that he was buried in the ground. So Jesus physically, literally, actually died. He was dead, dead, dead. There's no other explanation. The Romans were really good at killing people. Dead. Not only was he dead, but they put him in the ground for three days. He is buried right before the Sabbath. And then Easter morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, he is raised from the dead. And so you have this resurrection event so that the earthquake happens. The stone has been rolled away. People come into the garden and meet angels. Jesus is no longer there among the dead. Jesus is alive. And then I love the statement of verses 5 through 8, because Paul lays down eyewitnesses. 
Jesus didn't just appear to his mama. Jesus appeared to all these specific people. He names names. Go talk to James. Go talk to Cephas. Not only did he talk to these specific people, but he appeared to over 500 witnesses. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact. It would stand up in any law court. How many witnesses do you need? 500 people would stand up and say, Jesus died, and after he died, I met him in a physical way. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. 500 people would testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ when Paul is writing Corinth. How many witnesses do you need to the fact of Jesus' resurrection? Now today, if we put a call out and we asked people to assemble in the stadium in Salt Lake to proclaim the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as they have experienced it in their lives, we could fill that stadium. There wouldn't be room to sit down. There would be people standing in the parking lot. We could get a billion people to stand up and proclaim that Jesus' death is a historical fact and Jesus' resurrection is a historical fact and they could testify to the truth of that. Witnesses still exist today. I'm a witness to the truth of Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. And I'm a witness today that Jesus rose from the grave because I have experienced his resurrection power. My testimony stands, my friends. And so would yours. Resurrection. Not only did Jesus die, not only was the temple destroyed, but then three days later it raised again in fulfilling Jesus' sign. See, Jesus knew it was coming. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John chapter 2. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 2, Jesus is already talking about his death and resurrection. He knows it's coming. It's a powerful, powerful point. Not only did Jesus die on the cross and rise from the dead, but then he ascended. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Oh, if you're ever feeling discouraged, condemned, if you ever worry about your salvation being taken away, go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 verse 34 says this, Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, death and resurrection, who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. He not only died on the cross and rose from the grave, but he right now is sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for me. So that if the devil comes before the throne of God and says, oh, you ought to look at John. John is such a screwball. John is all these things going on. Jesus is making intercession between me and God the Father by saying, nope, covered in the blood, forgiven, He's a child of mine. He has the Holy Spirit. And he completely shuts out the enemy. There's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. My salvation and your salvation is safe in the hands of Jesus. And no accusation against you will stand because he is running intercession for us. He lived the perfect life as an example for you and I. He died on the cross for our sins. Then he rose from the dead in resurrection power. And then he ascended up into heaven where he continues to intercede for you and I until we arrive there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for Jesus and all that he has done for us, my friends. What can we do about this? I think what we can do is ask, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Is that forgiveness a part of your life? Have you experienced resurrection power? If death comes and then resurrection, are you ready for the resurrection in heaven? We aren't guaranteed this afternoon, my friends. I'm a plan maker. I like to make plans. But there's no guarantee we get to leave this building alive. Are you ready to meet God face to face? Are you ready for resurrection? Are you ready for eternity in heaven? you got to answer that question. 
because you don't have tomorrow to ask that question. 